I'm so pleased to um, introduce our two speakers for today. Um, and they'll be talking about some hot button topics um, related to ALS right now, in particular offering a Massachusetts perspective about that. So today we're delighted to host Dr. James Berry um, and his nurse practitioner, Sarah Lupino. Um, Dr. Berry leads the Massachusetts General Hospital Clinic at the Healy Center for ALS, caring for patients and helping to build and lead the multidisciplinary care team. He has helped to found the Telemedicine for People with ALS program, the ALS House Call program, and the Parenting at a Challenging Time programs within the clinic. Dr. Berry is also a dedicated ALS researcher with a focus on biomarker development and ALS clinical trials. He oversees a large biorepository collecting, storing, and sharing blood, DNA, and spinal fluid and accompanying patient information, which allows researchers around the globe to conduct critical research identifying biomarkers of ALS and developing novel therapeutics. He's particularly interested in changes in the immune system and their relationship with ALS onset and progression. Dr. Berry also leads projects developing digital endpoints for ALS trials that will help increase the objective data for trials while decreasing the burden on trial participants. Finally, he's deeply committed to developing novel therapeutics by translating discoveries in the lab into clinical trials and leading clinical trials that will transform our approach to care in ALS. He's joined by nurse practitioner, Sarah Lupino, who is the Associate Site Director for the Healy and AMG Center for Research at Mass General Hospital. In this role, she provides leadership and supervision to guide research staff in the implementation of translational clinical trials. In addition, Sarah cares for patients as a nurse practitioner, practitioner sorry, in the ALS um, clinic, and Sarah is committed to delivery of consistent high-quality research and patient care and to providing operational efficiencies and support to research staff in their efforts to conduct trials at the highest level for people with ALS. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. James Berry and Sarah Lupino. Hi, thank you, Jen, for having us today. I'm gonna to get started and just share my slides. There we go. Can everybody see these okay? Sounds good. So today we're gonna to talk about, um, just like Jen said, hot topics in ALS. We're gonna start by discussing feeding tubes. So I'll lead that discussion. And then James will go over COVID-19 vaccines from a Massachusetts perspective. And so thank you, Jen, for introducing us. Um, and so we'll go through some of our slides for information that we've gathered to share with you all. And then we can open it up to a Q&A session at the end for discussions. So it's very nice to meet you. Uh, James and I work together in the ALS Clinic and Research Center, and uh, it's been quite a year for us and for all of you as well. And so we're, we're happy to be here to share our, our knowledge with you. And a lot of this is based on feedback that we've gotten from our discussions with patients over the years um, and trying to incorporate some of the latest data and evidence that we have from our own practice. So I'm gonna launch into the topic of feeding tubes in ALS. So we should start with the basics, which is what is a feeding tube? And a feeding tube is a, a tube or device usually made of silicone or plastic that's inserted directly into the abdomen as a direct conduit to the GI tract. And so most people with ALS get a type of feeding tube called the gastrostomy tube. And the tubes are named based on where they insert within the GI tract. So gastrostomy just means a tube that goes directly into the stomach. And most people with ALS get this type of a feeding tube called the G-tube. There's other commonly used terms that you might hear um, that we can use interchangeably around feeding tubes. So gastrostomy tube, G-tube, enteral tube is another term, or a PEG tube, which is a specific type of tube that's placed 
And as you can see in these pictures, uh, G tube goes directly into the abdomen with usually a little bumper on the on the belly to help kind of protect the insertion site. And it goes through the abdominal wall, and this one ends in the stomach with a little balloon here to help keep it secure and in place. And depending on everybody's anatomy, which can be slightly different, some G-tubes lie more in the middle of the abdomen, some more higher, lower to the left or the right. So there's a little bit of variability on that from person to person. So feeding tube provides an alternative way for people to take in nutrition, hydration, and medications uh, for whom it's difficult to do so by mouth. And so nutrition can be formula. Uh, there's prescription-based specific uh, feeding tube formula that your um, provider can write a prescription for and a company can send out. Some people will also blenderize foods or put other things like Ensure or Boost or juices through a feeding tube to get in calories. You can also put regular tap water through the tube as a source for hydration. And then many patients will use the G-tube also to take in medications. If you have big like horse pills that are difficult to swallow, you can sometimes crush them up and mix them in water or get them in liquid preparation and put them through the tube. So the way that we really view feeding tube and ALS is as a tool to solve a problem. And there are certain symptoms for patients and we know that ALS is a very variable disease. So for some people, there's symptoms that are more bothersome than others, but kind of the list below are some of the things that we might identify when we're talking with patients that are really troublesome to them that a feeding tube can help to alleviate or help us to manage. So the first one is obvious if someone's having trouble swallowing food or choking on certain foods, or some patients tell us that they find eating to be really fatiguing or just burdensome and general. A feeding tube can be a way to offset some of that burden from having to take everything in by mouth. We also know in ALS that um, some patients have trouble with an appetite. So that's probably partly due to the fact that if it takes you a lot longer to eat, you get fuller faster. Another uh, area that we see is unintentional weight loss which uh, we think is probably due to hypermetabolic effects of the disease that um, some of our team members have done research on. So we think ALS patients might burn up to 30% more calories than the average person. And so that can contribute to pretty rapid weight loss. Breathing difficulties is another area. Um, there are some patients with ALS who have shortness of breath with certain activities and eating can be one of those activities. Um, or maybe physical trouble feeding yourself um, if one's having difficulty lifting their arms and bringing food to their mouth. So the potential benefits from a feeding tube can be to help offset these problems. So our goal is that we relieve the burden of eating or taking medications by mouth, help to improve hydration. And then our real goal is to curb or stabilize weight loss as much as we can by using the tube as a way to get in extra calories. So for us as ALS clinicians, there's three key factors that guide us in advising patients with ALS and their family and caregivers on when should we start thinking about feeding tube. And the timing here is really important. So the first area is um, that we'll talk that we'll watch for and talk about is breathing. So one of the key ways that we measure breathing function in ALS is through a vital capacity test, which many of you may have done in clinic. So we're measuring the uh, maximum amount of volume of air you can blow out after taking a deep breath in out of your lungs. And we know that as that number changes or as breathing becomes potentially more symptomatic for patients, the risk for a surgery go up. So we wanna make sure that people are going into a potential procedure, any procedure, whether it's a feeding tube or something else um, with a good breathing um, status. Another key change that we look for that we've already spoken about a little bit is weight loss. So if people are really precipitously losing weight really quickly, we want to make sure, again, that if we're going into a surgery that um, they're not too frail or that we can try to curb the weight loss with the feeding tube sooner rather than later. And we know that weight maintenance in ALS is um, people who have a slightly higher body mass index or higher weight for height. Um, it may correlate with a slower prognosis. So that weight maintenance is, is an important thing for us to monitor for in the clinic. And then the mo other obvious one is swallow changes. So if, if swallowing is really inhibiting people, um, maybe people who have what we call bulbar onset ALS, where speech and swallowing difficulty is their predominant symptom, we want to intervene on that um, with a tool like a feeding tube to help, um, help use that as a way to get an extra calories and nutrition.
And so with all of that said, we want to really reinforce that getting a feeding tube is a very personal decision. And it depends on who one is as a person, what quality of life means to them, and how they might perceive a feeding tube as a way to improve their day to day and make things a little bit easier. So one of the things that we talk a lot with patients about is how do you see the feeding tube impacting your quality of life? And what does that mean to you? And how can this maybe be a tool to help you? We also want to address the risks of the procedure, um, which can vary from person to person depending on their medical history. So that's another big thing that weighs into the decision. And then care considerations at home, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail, sort of thinking through um, what will be required of me to take care of a feeding tube and how might this impact my family and my caregivers on their day to day. It's really important to remember that this is always a reversible procedure um, and you can use a G-tube as much or as little as you want throughout your disease progression. So some people might get it a little bit prophylactically or early and, and maybe just use it to get in um, extra hydration or can continue to eat by mouth and use a feeding tube to supplement their nutrition and get in extra calories. So it's really a tool that you can use um, to kind of benefit most of the areas that you see problems with in your day to day. And I think it's important to note that not everybody with ALS has to get a feeding tube. So if somebody says that, you know, feeding tube is not for me, I don't see it, that kind of risk benefit ratio there, or it's not something that I really want to incorporate in my day-to-day -day management of, of my symptoms with ALS, that's absolutely fine. And so what we would do is kind of work on managing those symptoms using other tools that we have in the clinic. And one of the other areas that's important to know up front is to talk with your caregiver team. So if you're in the decision process about a feeding tube, to maybe pause with your care team, whether it be your family, your friends, whoever might be helping you out at home or down in down the road, how would you potentially have help with a feeding tube at home and how would you use it in your day to day? And who might be available to help one with a feeding tube now or in the future? So kind of switching gears into a little more of the nitty gritty details about a feeding tube. So there's basic anatomy and this is a standard um, feeding tube, one of the ones that we usually place at MGH. So they might look a little bit different depending on the institution or, or where they're done. Um, but in general, if you kind of mark the border over here at this piece called the disc, this part is the inside of your body from the disc to the balloon. And this balloon is what secures the tube in place and keeps it from falling out. And the balloon is typically filled with sterile saline, so kind of salt water, that's injected through the tube through what's called the balloon port. So when the surgeon makes an incision and puts the tube in, they'll then inflate the balloon port to hold it in place. And there's a little hole at the end of the balloon so that formula and water can flow through. On the outside of your body, um, the, the G-tube will hang out. This one's a little bit one of the longer one. And there's three ports here. So we already checked off the balloon port. And then there's a feeding port and a medication port. The med port is usually a little bit smaller and you can use it, you don't have to use it. Some people prefer to, if they're gonna put medication through a tube to just crush everything up and use the big feeding port in the middle. And this one is where you put in water or formula or juice, or you can crush up your medications. Um, so it's one, two, three ports is what we usually see. And this little cap opens up and what many people do is connect a syringe, which is this piece here, and use the syringe to plunge in water or formula potentially. And there's other ways to push in formula through a G-tube other than the syringe that I'll show you pictures of in just a little bit. So uh, this is an example of a standard G-tube. So uh, many patients who have a feeding tube have one that looks like this initially placed. And this is the longer tube. It hangs out of the abdomen. One of the benefits of this type of tube is that it can be easier to manipulate because it's longer. If you have trouble with hand dexterity, you can pick it up and kind of manipulate the cap and the syringe with a little bit more ease. And this is one of the tubes that's usually routinely exchanged out um, every several months or so, depending on the type of tube. And even though it hangs out, many people will tape it down or secure it against the abdomen just for a little bit of extra protection. And you can see here, there's that bumper disc that I was talking about that kind of lays flat against the skin and protects the insertion site. And then this tube has what's called a clamp over here. So you can kind of pinch it off while you have it open. So if you need to drop it to go grab something, um, it makes sure that formula doesn't leak out. Another type of tube that we commonly see is called a low profile tube that lies flush up against the abdomen. 
And truthfully, there is no, um, from a safety or efficacy perspective, there's no one tube that's better over the other. They're both just simply tubes that go into the belly. Um, but some patients prefer the low profile tube um, because it doesn't hang out as much. Aesthetically, it might be more appealing to a person. Um, the thing with this is that it requires extension tubing that gets connected whenever you want to put in formula or water or medications. And the extension tubing can be rinsed out and reused multiple times. Um, that can sometimes require a little bit more hand dexterity. So that's one consideration. And many times this type of a tube, because it's a little bit smaller, can't be placed initially. So many patients will have the longer tube placed first, and then the surgeon might say, come back in a couple weeks or several weeks, and you can have it routinely exchanged for the low profile tube. And the exchange of a G-tube is not another surgery. It's a simple outpatient procedure where they just numb the area, take the old tube out and pop a new one in. So it's pretty straightforward. So how is the feeding tube placed? So this is a surgical procedure. Um, we do them at MGH. Many um, you know, standard hospitals have clinics that place feeding tubes all day long in many different types of patients um, with many different diseases. And it's usually done as a planned day surgery. Uh, from a medical perspective, it's a very straightforward procedure. Sometimes it requires an overnight stay. Um, if the person maybe has a history of, um, you know, takes them a little longer to wake up for anesthesia, um, or we want to monitor them a little bit more closely, we might keep them overnight for observation. Um, at Mass General, whenever we're setting up a feeding tube, we'll do a pre-op visit in our clinic, which is usually a requirement um, that many hospitals, in order to have a surgery, you have a pre-op visit where they do an exam, collect some lab work, fill out a healthcare proxy form. And so this could be arranged by your ALS care team. Primary care offices can also refer people for feeding tube placements as can GI specialists. And we get a lot of questions about the different surgical approaches. Um, we can kind of divide them into two broad categories. So there's different ways surgically to place feeding tubes. And how we design that depends partly on the patient, maybe their medical history or if they've had past surgery to their abdomen before. Um, but more often than not, it really just varies based on the institution. So at Mass General, we um, usually go through interventional radiology to place RG tubes. So they're a team that has their specific surgical approach for placing them. Um, and that's just because we have an established relationship with them and they place all the tubes in our patients who have ALS. So it works out well. From a research perspective, um, there isn't one surgical approach that's been proven to be highly superior or safer than, than another. Um, another. Another surgical approach that you might hear um, talked about or referred to as a PEG. So that's a type of a G-tube and PEG is a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. So they just put a scope um, into the person's esophagus to help identify the stomach um, and then make an incision to place the tube. A rig is radiologically inserted G-tube. So that's that type of procedure. They'll use imaging to find the stomach and then they'll place, um, place the incision. So a couple different options there just to make you aware of. So after the procedure, it's uh, typically people are home resting on the couch the, that night or maybe the next morning. Things you can expect are potentially, uh, well, um, some discomfort and soreness. So you know, everybody has a little bit of pain after the surgery, which is expected. It's typically very well managed with over-the-counter medications like Tylenol or ibuprofen. It's like a muscle soreness. It's a little bit um, more painful when people move or more tender and that gets better incrementally every day. And so within a couple of weeks, people um, typically say that the soreness and discomfort is 100% resolved. We also see a small amount of kind of drainage, drainage or kind of crusting around the G-tube. Um, I don't know if many of you have had your ears pierced, but that's a common analogy that we'll use. So if you remember um, when you got your ears pierced for the first time, you get these little kind of crusties around while it's healing. You can get the same thing at a G-tube site. It's not a concern for infection. It's just kind of your body making fluids because you have a new hole in there. Um, most G-tubes after they're placed will have some sutures around the insertion site to help kind of keep the whole mechanism in place. The types of sutures that we use at MGH are called T-tacks. So there's these little plastic discs that have a single suture through the center of them. And these have to stay in anywhere from several days to a couple weeks and usually can be taken out pretty easily by primary care, or by um, an ALS clinic or a visiting nurse. So basic care at home. 
uh, G2, once those stitches come out, can be cleaned just like you would clean the rest of your body. So just regular soap and water as part of your daily hygiene. You can see here, this is a Mickey button or a low profile tube, and you can use a little Q-tip to that's wet to clean around the edges there. Some people will put a gauze pad or a dressing around or might use gauze tape to kind of secure everything. Um, if you have that drainage or that crusties, the gauze pad can help with that, but it's not a requirement. We don't recommend hydrogen peroxide or alcohol or sort of any chemical topicals there. The skin at the insertion site can be very sensitive. So you just want to use mild soap and water and nothing else. And you want to make sure that especially if you're not using your feeding tube yet for nutrition or hydration or meds, that you flush it at least once a day with water to keep it clean and clear on the inside. In terms of activity with the feeding tube, after that initial um, you know, couple weeks recovery after the placement and everything's healed up, one can return to all normal activities. It's okay to shower or take a bath with a feeding tube. People can go in the pool or in the ocean. We just say try to avoid stagnant bodies of water like ponds or lakes or hot tubs because those tend to harbor a little bit more bacteria. And a lot of people ask about us about traveling with a feeding tube. So there's no restrictions on traveling. Um, TSA knows that people might come through with a feeding tube. And so you might disclose that. And that's usually not a problem whatsoever. We do advise that if you're using your feeding tube uh, for formula or nutrition, and it's going to be a long trip. You know, and you may want to give yourself some calories on the plane to make sure you pack extra with you and supplies in your carry-on. And you may um, request a letter from your ALS clinic team or your primary care so that the, they let you bring all that onto the airplane. Transfers is another area that we talk to people a lot about. Um, many people will say that they're nervous about transferring or caregivers will be nervous about transferring their loved ones with a feeding tube. It's a common worry, but it's something that people are definitely able to do successfully. Usually it takes a little bit of strategy and planning ahead. Sometimes having, if it's a couple people helping to transfer, have one person be dedicated on just watching the feeding tube. You can tape it down to secure it and make sure everything's buttoned up before you do the transfer. Um, and then these are just some kind of tips. Some people use these abdominal wraps to secure the tube for transfers that you can purchase on Amazon or online. And then this person kind of just rigged up a nice um, gauze tape to secure it down with a pad here, which would be absolutely fine for transfer too. So um, in terms of the formula, so going through here, there's different methods to administer formula through a feeding tube. The first that we talk about is called um, a bolus syringe. And you can see that as we graduate to these different methods, um, depending on the method that you use, you can have the formula flow in a little bit faster or a lot slower. So part of this depends on tolerance. There are some people for whom getting the um, nutrient dense formula through a G-tube feels like taking in Thanksgiving dinner in one foul bolus swoop. So some people can feel really full or a little bit nauseous. And to offset that, what we'll do is often slow the rate of the formula so that we're not shoving all this into your GI tract at once. Um, but other people do just fine tolerating the feeding tube. So we might use a bolus syringe where you drop uh, the formula in a syringe and you just slowly push it in. Usually it takes about 15 minutes to get in one carton or one can of formula. You can also pull the plunger out and pour in the formula and let it flow in by gravity. So that's the gravity syringe method. Often a vendor who supplies the formula can also send you, in addition to the syringes, what's called the gravity bag. It looks like a big IV bag, but you can rinse it out and reuse it and pour in the formula and let it drip in a little bit slower. And then once in a while, we'll have patients who um, you know, might have history of kind of trouble tolerating foods or formula. And so what we'll do is um, appeal to insurance to get coverage for an overnight pump feed. And this is what um, a lot of people, if they're in the hospital, might have seen this before um, with like family members as a way to get in fluid, for example. Um, so more often than not, people are using these methods at home, um, but a pump is something that can be set up at home for people who need it. And usually it goes overnight and delivers all of your calories for the day over about 10 to 12 hours. So the goal with the formula is for us to maximize calories as much as possible. We know that a high calorie diet in ALS is the preferred way to get in food. How those calories are prepared, we haven't done as much research on. Um, so many people have questions about high fiber, low fiber, organic formulas. There's so many brands out there. Um, I think there's pros and cons to everything and it depends on the person. So uh, it's important to note that all the formulas in general are typically lactose-free, high calorie and nutrient dense. So these 
um, contain all of the vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, and calories that you would take in normally through an oral diet, just in the formula, which is why it's a prescription-based formula that's usually recommended by a dietitian or a nutritionist. Um, there are some formulas that might also be glucose-free for people with like diabetes, high fiber or low fiber, depending on um, how your bowels are doing. And then some people really prefer an organic or all natural formula approach. And there are more and more brands coming out that offer that as an option. Um, multiple factors determine what type of formula. One of them obviously is, is going to be the person's personal preference, health history, insurance also plays a role. There are certain kind of tier one formulas that people have to try in order to try other alternates. Um, there are many vendors that supply these formulas. So if something's not covered by insurance, often they have kind of discounted um, pay out of pocket versions of formula. So people can purchase formula from these companies too, if insurance coverage is an issue. And usually you can get them at a lower rate from the supplier too, which is a nice trick. Um, this is just a mock-up of a feed schedule. So a lot of caregivers um, will draft up kind of a daily schedule of when they'll do their feedings with, with patients or patients might draft this up for themselves. Um, and so this is kind of an example. Most people get in anywhere from a half a can to one can to maybe one and a half cans in one, in one um, session or one sitting. And then you can also calculate free water that we'll talk about in, a, in an extra minute. So in addition to flushing, because anytime you put in formula or medications through a G-tube, you have to flush before and after with a little bit of water to clean out the inside. Um, you can also do extra water flushes to help build up hydration. And then oftentimes people will also add their medications on here too, so that they have kind of a running list of, of what they're doing through the tube, which can be helpful to stay on top of things and, and be organized. Um, switching gears a little bit into medications, um, again, you can um, have your medications crushed up. There's many different types of pill crushers. I always say don't, don't knock the old fashioned mortar and pestle. That works just as well as a fancy expensive pill crusher. Um, there's also uh, some medications that can be prescribed in liquid formulation. So we always say check with whoever prescribed the medication initially and see if that's an option. The liquids um, can sometimes be a little bit viscous or thick. So often people will still dilute it in a little bit of water and then plunge it through the feeding tube. Medications have to be crushed, mixed in water, and then given through the plunger method in order to make sure that you um, have enough turbulence in there to really administer the meds fully through the tube. Uh, and you want to make sure that if you are using this to flush with water before and after so that the medications don't cake up in the inside of the tube. Uh, we talked about hydration a little bit already. Uh, your ALS care team can help to calculate free water. There's kind of a general basic math problem that we'll use to say how many milliliters of water per day do you need? And then we subtract that from the water that you might already be drinking by mouth or getting in through the formula or through the flushes so that you can know kind of what's the extra water flush that might help uh, meet my hydration needs today. It's really important not to overlook the benefits of good hydration in ALS. And I think a lot of people hear about feeding tubes and immediately think about the formula and the meds, but water is so, so critical to managing many symptoms. Constipation is a common thing we see in ALS that dehydration can exacerbate. Having good hydration also reduces thick phlegm and secretions for many people and just overall improves energy and fatigue is such a common symptom that if we can offset it even a little bit by just getting an extra hydration, I would say that's a win. So these last few slides are just troubleshooting. So we talked a lot about the benefits of a feeding tube, um, but we want to also share with you guys some of the um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So some of the challenges that we sometimes see, and it's important to note that all of these things I'm gonna list are manageable and your ALS clinical care team are here to support you. And there's many resources online that can help you kind of navigate some of these challenges. And not everybody experiences what's on this list with their feeding tubes, which is important to kind of note what are some of the common things that we see and how do we manage them. So difficulty tolerating feeds, we mentioned a little bit earlier um, that some formulas can go in a little bit faster, make people feel nauseous or more constipated or have looser stools. And so oftentimes we'll be adjusting formulas or the way that we give them to help people feel a little bit better if that's a problem for them. Um, changes in bowels, more often than not, um, the saying that the nurses love to use is liquid in, liquid out, liquid out when it comes with a feeding tube. So, um, Many people will notice that their bowels are a little bit looser 
doesn't cause diarrhea or urgency, but just looser stools. Um, oftentimes, if you enter the procedure a little bit constipated at, at baseline, uh, having a feeding tube to loosen things up can actually help in that department. But if that's a problem, we can absolutely help manage it clinically. A lot of people ask about infection. Should I be worried about an infection? What signs should I look for? And we actually don't see infection as a super common thing with feeding tubes. Um, in terms of keeping it clean, Theoretically, anything that's clean enough to go into your mouth is clean enough to go into a feeding tube, which is why we say, you know, you wouldn't alcohol swab your mouth. So you wouldn't alcohol swab your G-tube site necessarily. Um, but once in a while, we do see that site can get infected or irritated. And so, you know, typically a topical or a quick course of an oral antibiotic will take care of that. Um, and I will say that if you ever see, um, if you're someone who has a feeding tube and you see something at the site and you're not sure it looks a little angry or a little bit abnormal, take a picture and send it to your clinical care team um, because we love looking at pictures and often helps explain the story a lot easier than over the phone. Um, G-tubes can become clogged. Usually it's because people haven't been flushing them as often or with enough volume as they should have been, and that's okay. Um, there are ways to help try to dislodge a clog. Um, if you know, there's kind of home remedies that we can talk people through over the phone on, but at the end of the day, if we're really unable to unclog a tube at home, uh, we do have people go in through urgent care and emergency room and they um, have en enzymes that they can give that can dissolve the clot. And sometimes what they'll do is just switch out the, the old tube for a new one altogether if we have to. Uh, weight loss. So some people still continue to lose weight, even if they're giving calories to themselves through a feeding tube. So sometimes a simple adjustment of formula, um, maybe to have a more calorie dense formula or to adjust the schedule a little bit can help to offset that. Um, another big question that we get is what happens if the feeding tube falls out or gets pulled out? So um, if that happens, and again, this isn't something that we see very commonly, but once in a while will be kind of an accident or a, you know, a fall or something will get yanked. So we say immediately reinsert the tube into the hole if you can, because that hole, that trapped, can actually close up very quickly within a matter of um, even a couple hours. So we want you to try to insert the tube back in to just keep the trapped in place. And then we say, don't hesitate to go to your local emergency room or urgent care to have them do what's called the G2 rescue. So they'll pop in a new tube and uh, send you home. But it is important that you seek care immediately so that that hole doesn't close up. Um, and then another kind of common thing that I have some pictures on is called hypergranulation tissue, um, fondly referred to by nurses as proud flesh. So sometimes what can happen is people can get a little bit of overgrowth of this beefy red tissue around the insertion site, and it can look kind of weird. It can worry people a lot, but it's actually... Um, not anything to really write home about necessarily, um, unless it becomes bothersome to you. And what this is, is your body is sensing that there's a hole that wasn't originally there before, and I'm going to try to overgrow and close it up, close it up. And so your body just kind of produces this extra tissue. It doesn't happen with everybody, but once in a while, people will notice this. Um, the tissue sometimes can, with a little bit of friction or rubbing, can bleed a little bit easier, become a little bit tender. If that's the case, we can treat it with um, a topical medication called silver nitrate that just helps to cauterize and, and take it away. And these little matchsticks are actually silver nitrate. So you just wet it and you kind of dab the, um, the tissue and you can take it off pretty easily that way. And it's, it's not too uncomfortable. A lot of times we'll send out a visiting nurse or um, send somebody into a G-tube clinic to have silver nitrate to treat it. There's many resources on feeding too, um, many avenues for pounds and cows to find support. VNA or home care teams um, can come out for teaching and support for patients who have more trouble leaving their house. There's many vendors that we work with for nutrition services like Quorum or Option Care that have dietitians and help set people up with supplies and send monthly shipments of those supplies like formula and the syringes. Um, going with your ALS clinic team, don't hesitate to reach out to your care providers for troubleshooting or any questions or issues. Nurses are really experts in the day-to-day -day management of feeding tubes, so uh, we're always happy to, to lend an ear and, and help out where we can and give advice. And then there's many online resources through the ALS Association. Quorum and CVS also has some really great videos on how to give um, formula through a gravity bag, for example. And then there's also another group called the Olay Foundation that has um, kind of an online loaner program of different formulas and supplies, and then also a lot of great online resources for teaching as well.
So our final thoughts on feeding tube is, um, again, this is a very personal decision and it's an individualized shared decision-making approach that we take for people who are deciding about whether to get a feeding tube. It can be used as a tube tool to help optimize one's nutrition, hydration, and medication dosing. And just at the end of the day, please remember your ALS care team, your community organizations like the ALS Association, um, your ALS clinic, um, other local organizations that you might work with your family. Everyone's here to support you and we're here to answer your questions and help you navigate next steps, whatever those might be down the road. Now I'll hand it off to Dr. Barry to switch gears onto the COVID-19 vaccine and considerations in ALS. Yeah, I, boy, I have to, what, a, what a treat to, to get that presentation. Um, I, I think we're gonna do questions at the end, but I, I guess I would encourage anyone to, um, you know, if you, if you have questions now, don't, don't wait to jot them down or to write them into the, the chat or, um, you know, because I, I don't want people to, to lose focus. I, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about vaccine and, and considerations in, in ALS, and particularly in Massachusetts. Although, to be honest, a lot of this is not ALS specific. A lot of this will be um, just sort of um, talking about, about the vaccines for COVID uh, in general. Next slide. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I hardly need to say it, but I think as I, as I, as I sat down to think about this, I, I wanted to kind of look at this. I mean, you know, if we look at all of the all of the combat casualties and wars going back to the 1700s in the U.S., you know, we're approaching that that death toll, I and mean, this has been a, an absolutely devastating um, event. And and of course, that's just the U.S. Now, you know, the we we've, we've I think done a lot to to really try to combat this. Next slide. And the main tool that we have used um, is social distancing and masks. And you know these are simple things, but um, and I think you know we've learned a lot since the beginning of the pandemic. This is a park near my home where you know even the park was closed in the spring. And I think part of that was we didn't know how to be in a park and not be together. You know, so we didn't need to figure out sort of social distancing. It turns out that actually being outside and being being slightly apart is probably one of the safest places to be. So we've, we've, our, our thinking has evolved. The same thing happened with masks early on. That, you know, we, we, we didn't know how important they were, would be, but then, then they were. That's my daughter right there. Um, next slide. Um, and um, one of the things that we found is that, you know, with the, so we had, a, we had a study that was going already that was using digital tools to monitor uh, people's behavior. And our, our goal with this is really to come up with a new endpoint for clinical trials to, so that we can we can monitor people's behavior and get a real picture of their behavior and see whether new drugs that we're testing might, might change the way that people live their lives. And so this is using an app on a cell phone, and we can see how much time people spend at home each day. And in the group of people that we were following, um, they were spending you know, nearly 20 hours a day at home prior to the pandemic, but immediately when the sort of state of emergency came into being last year, we saw basically that, that almost everybody was staying at home all the time. And in fact, the excursions from home probably were somebody going to a second location on the weekends mostly. Next slide. Um, that compares to the general population who was spending about 10 hours a day at home. And this is just from publicly available information about 10 hours a day at home. <clears throat> and that increased to about 14 hours a day um, after, you know, after the, the pandemic was declared in, in, in March. So really, um, you know, people with ALS were remarkably good at quarantining and at social distancing. And I think that's important because um, it, I think it, it really did reduce the amount of COVID that we saw, especially in those early days. Next slide. So the, the, the total cases, you know, has been rising. That's that has slowed because of what we've done for, on, in social distancing, masks, and I think more recently, you know, as well because we're beginning to to see the vaccine come out. Next slide. The vaccines are are beginning to drive down the rates in, in Massachusetts. Um, you can see that the the number of people vaccinated has gone up and up and up, and we're seeing this, you know, hugely rise. Um, you know, with sort of a you know, much more faster and faster rate. Um, so that by April 8th, 40% of people had, had received one dose uh, and 20, almost 25%, uh, two, two doses fully vaccinated. Next slide. 
So just in case people didn't know, we, we've gone through phase one and then a, a number of stages within phase two in Massachusetts. Um, and we are you know, currently people who are age 55 and over or people who have one medical condition. That is not very closely specified, but we're in that sort of stage now. So really anybody with ALS um, can be vaccinated. Importantly, almost anybody who's a caregiver, I mean, you know, try to find somebody without one medical condition. It's, it's a little bit challenging. So I think, um, you know, most people now are, are eligible and, and uh, can go out and, and, and find vaccines. Next slide. The state has really put a fair amount of effort into, um, you know, after I think some, some real challenges early on into helping people sign up. So there are a number of ways to, to sign up to find vaccines. You can pre-register at vaccinesignup.mass.gov um, and they'll, you'll be notified when it's your turn to schedule a, an appointment. That may be now, in fact. Vaxfinder.mass.gov will help you look for appointments at pharmacies and healthcare providers and other community locations. So not just the, the large mega locations. And then there is this um, mass COVID vaccination help, which is uh, made up of these COVID angels. I know a few of the people who have, who have been doing this, they're very dedicated to really just helping others go through this process. They can help navigate, facilitate the registration process, cut down on some of the stress of trying to find this. Um, it, it, because it, even with these resources, it can be very stressful. So I would encourage people if they're looking for a, a way to get vaccinated to really reach out to one of these. And, and you know, I, would, I would just put in a plug for the, the um, mass COVID vax help. Dot com is, it's been pretty wonderful. Next slide. There is a homebound vaccination program for people who are unable to leave their home to get to a vaccination site, even with assistance. Um, there is this central intake number, 833-983-0485, um, um, and you will be registered. Um, and there's also a website, which is longer, harder for me to read, um, but uh, people can, can take that out. I want to I want to talk for a minute about those are kind of the the, the long and the short of, of of the vaccine and how you can access it, but I think there's also um, a lot of just uncertainty about how the vaccines work, and so I just wanted to give a broad overview of how these vaccines work. A lot of this is from a really wonderful um, article that was in New York Times about some of these from the CDC, from the NIH, um, and you know really. I think really some resources that are that are pretty basic, uh, uh, per, per, they give pretty basic information, but in a way that is I think really really useful. This um, this sort of circle with these red things sticking off of it is a is a sketch of the coronavirus. So the outside of the coronavirus has a, a lipid layer, and sticking through that lipid layer are these spike proteins that we hear a lot about. These spike proteins are important because they are a way that our body recognizes. Uh, the COVID viral particle. Inside of the virus, by the way, uh, is kind of the, 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 the mechanism of, of the virus, the RNA from the virus that tells the, uh, the cell how to produce more viruses. So, so once it invades the cell, it takes over the cell's mechanism to make more and more viruses, and then they, they're released from that cell to infect other cells. But this spike protein, really important because it doesn't change much and it's easily um, recognized by our body and we can use it to train vaccines. Next slide. Now, three vaccines have, em have emergency approval in the US. The Pfizer, BioNTech, and then and, and the Moderna are um, of a feather. And, and then Johnson & Johnson, made by their subunit Janssen, um, is slightly different, and I'll, I'll tell you about that, and that's more like AstraZeneca. The AstraZeneca vaccine is not available in the US, but is available in Europe. So Pfizer and BioNTech is available to people 16 years and older. It requires two shots that are given three weeks apart. Um, to be fully vaccinated, you have to wait two weeks after the second shot, and it's about 95% effective against symptomatic COVID. The Moderna vaccine, similar technology, and I'll go through the technology in just a second, available for people 18 years and older. Um, it is two shots given four weeks apart. To be fully vaccinated, you have to wait two weeks after the second shot. And again, around 95% effective against symptomatic COVID. Uh, 
These are actually about 80% effective after the first shot, shortly after the first shot. Um, and so, uh, you know, that second shot just really boosts the immunity. Now, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a different technology. It's available, available to people 18 years and older. It only requires one shot and people are fully vaccinated two weeks later. It's about 85% protect, protective against severe COVID and 66% effective in preventing any COVID. Now, these numbers are hard to compare exactly because when we say preventing any COVID, that's not the same as symptomatic COVID. And so, we, you know, one has to be a little cautious in, in comparing the numbers perfectly. I think we have very good efficacy or effectiveness for these uh, for these um, uh, vaccines. The flu vaccine is about forty percent effective every year, and so you know we are way above that mark, and that makes a remarkable difference in the flu season every year. So, I think we're we're hitting an, an you know an incredible efficacy mark, especially to have been developed so quickly. Next slide. So I alluded to this, but um, the, the, um, the two vaccines on the left, the Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines and the Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca are viral vector vaccines. And I'll explain what that means in just a second. Next slide. So this is just a representation of what it looks like and what do we mean about first and second dose and how are people protected? So the line in yellow is people who are taking a placebo. And that's basically people who are developing uh, COVID over time. So that line, sort of each one of those notches and each one of those stair steps up in a line is somebody who developed COVID and it keeps going up and up and up. And, you know, even though COVID is very common, it's still, you know, in, in the trials was a small percentage of people. But what you see in the, what is that, purple line, um, is that a couple of weeks after the first dose, you really see a leveling off of the number of people who are, who are getting COVID. We don't have great data about what happens between the first, the first and second dose, except we do see a leveling off. Certainly after that second dose, you can see how remarkably effective this is at preventing any more COVID from occurring. Next slide. There are side effects. Um, when you get the shot, most people have some pain. Maybe there's some redness, maybe some swelling. Um, with the, um, with less so with the first, uh, one, but but more so with the second one, there can be tiredness, headache, muscle pain, chills, fever, nausea. Um, you you know you can apply a cool or a warm compress to the arm. You can um, drink plenty of fluids, dress lightly. Um, you know, um, take care of yourself. Uh, rest if if you have these more systemic you know fatigue, chills, fever uh, kinds of symptoms. One thing that is not on the list here that is I think very notable is shortness of breath, cough, um, uh, you know, low oxygen. These are some of the things that I think people have been a little bit worried about with these vaccines um, when they're not informed of what these side effects are. The side effects are you feel really crummy and, um, and, and not you can't breathe. And that makes it a much safer thing to have these side effects than to have COVID. The other thing to say is that many people do not have any of these side effects. Uh, and some do. They also go away. This does not mean that people are sick. It just means that your body is mounting an immune response, preparing to fight off COVID in the future. Next slide. So um, I included a slide about AstraZeneca blood clotting risk. And we now, as of today, have to add the Johnson & Johnson uh, um, vaccine to this. So as of today, there's sort of a recommended pause in the J&J &J vaccine for exactly the reasons that I'll go through here in very, very similar, maybe somewhat lower right now, um, reported numbers. Um, and that has to do with blood clotting. And <clears throat> so it probably is an effect of, of this kind of delivery mechanism. And the FDA will review uh, these cases and uh, then we'll hear what they what they. Uh, decide to do. Now, the EMA, the, the European Union, already paused AstraZeneca and then went back to administering it. Um, what, what they found in AstraZeneca is that there were se severe blood clotting events in about one per 100,000, and there was a death of about seven per 10 million. Um, you know, something like out of 25 million vaccines, there were 62 what are called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So that's a very fancy way of saying there was a blood clot 
in one of the, the veins in the brain. That's a sort of a central vein. Um, and those can be really, really, really um, bad. Um, and then there were 24 blood clots in the, in the gut and, and there were 18 deaths overall. So, you know, I mean, certainly something that is um, difficult um, and, and obviously we wouldn't want to see. At the same time, it's important to note that per 10 million coronavirus causes about 20,000 20, deaths. So orders and orders and orders of magnitude more. And that's, I think, why the European Union went back to the AstraZeneca blood clotting risk. Um, it may be that there is a risk profile of people who are at higher risk for clotting and, and shouldn't have this. So we'll learn more in time to come. Um, I think that um, you know it, it, it is a, a little complicated. And again, I think it's related to technology. But if you had to take your odds on one or the other, coronavirus is a much more, um, you know, coronavirus is something I want to tangle with. Next slide. So I want to talk first about the mRNA vaccine. So this is Pfizer and, um, and Moderna. And the way that these vaccines work is there's this molecule called mRNA, which contains the instructions for making protein. And that molecule is surrounded by uh, nanolipids, which is basically just a fatty layer. And the reason, that, the reason that the companies do this is because that allows it to enter cells. So the, that fatty layer allows, basically allows that mRNA to slip inside of cells. So it, you, you put the, the vaccine in the body, um, that vaccine slips inside of cells, it puts the mRNA there, and then the cells use that mRNA as a template to make the harmless coronavirus spike protein. It's not the whole virus, it's just a part of the virus. It's that spike protein, it's the one that doesn't change over time very much in the coronavirus. And the cells make it, and then they display that spike protein on their service, surface. They sort of have these receptors that hold it out and say, oh, you know, look at this. And immune cells come by, white blood cells come by, and they recognize that spike protein. And they get activated. They say, oh, wait, this isn't supposed to be here. We're going we're gonna to make a fuss about this. We're going to give you a fever. We're going to make your arm hurt. And then, then we're going to quiet down. But we are going to remember this. And we are going to be able to make antibodies. So if we ever see that spike protein again, we're going to make antibodies right away. There'll be no delay. And that's why, that's why the vaccines help. It teaches our body how to make antibodies so we're prepared. And how long our, our white blood cells remember that spike protein will dictate how frequently we need to have the vaccine. Now, in the case of something like measles, you, you never need to have the vaccine again. Your body remembers for your whole life. In the case of flu, because of changes in the virus and because it doesn't invoke that much memory, um, you know, we need to have it every year. So those are kind of the extremes. And uh, we'll see the data coming out about the, these vaccines so far is that at six months anyway, there is a, still a very robust memory in the people who have been vaccinated. Uh, and we hope, you know, the longer the better for, for that. Next slide. So the, oh, oops, this should say how it works, viral vector vaccines. The, the only difference in the viral vector vaccines is that a modified version of a different virus, which we call a vector, is what delivers the mRNA. So that mRNA, instead of being inside a fatty layer, it's put into a, a harmless virus. Um, the virus cannot replicate, it's called an adenovirus or adenovirus. And the adenovirus uh, has all of its contents sort of shelled out and we only put in this mRNA for the vaccine. And the vir that, that, that vector virus, that adenovirus, delivers the mRNA to the cells. And, and that's the only difference. The rest of the pathway is the same. Um, and so, you know, um, both of these work and we'll see what happens with this blood clotting risk. Next slide. So just to put sort of a, a picture on this, um, if we look at the left-hand side that says vaccinated cell, inside you'll see sort of near the top something that says mRNA. That little curly red uh, molecule is being translated into a protein. It's made into the spike protein. That spike protein, three of those spike proteins come, come together to be a spike. And there's a combination of spikes and spike proteins. And those are, as I said, displayed on the outside of the cell. Now, if we move to the other side, one of our, one kind of cell of immune cell is called a B cell. A B cell comes along and has receptors 
it recognizes those spike proteins and it begins to secrete antibodies. And there's this helper T cell that actually helps activate the B cell. And then the B cell and the T cell remember this. And it, as I said, it's that memory that helps us uh, be ready to fight off COVID in the future. Next slide. So that's kind of the science of the vaccinations. Um, we've talked about, you know, waiting two weeks after your, your second dose, in the case of Pfizer or Moderna, or after your first dose for Johnson Johnson, then your body is ready to fight this off. So, you know, what can we do when we're fully vaccinated? So we can be inside a home or private setting um, with anybody else who's been fully vaccinated without a mask. Um, we can visit with, with sort of one household of vaccinated people. Basically what, what, what the CDC is saying here is, you know, a s s contact with a few people that haven't been vaccinated, that's probably okay. Contact though with, uh, if we go, come down to the very bottom, attend medium or, or large gatherings, it is still possible to get, get COVID if you've been vaccinated and you don't want to push your luck too much. So being in a very large crowd, um, you know, probably pushes us beyond what we're willing to do. And um, the other thing that, that, that is recommended against is being without a mask with people who are at increased risk for severe, for people who are in, at increased risk for severe COVID-19. So that is to say, um, you know, people are in these very high risk groups like um, someone with severe asthma, someone with COPD. And the question comes up, what does that mean for ALS? And, and, and what kind of risk group is someone with ALS in? And the answer is it depends. Someone who has very impaired breathing from ALS is at a higher risk, not necessarily that they will automatically get more severe COVID, but a moderate or severe case of COVID and somebody who has breathing difficulties to begin with will have more severe implications for someone with ALS. So it really comes down to sort of continuing to be cautious. If you're around people who a small group of people, especially if they've been vaccinated, I think that's a much safer proposition than being um, you know, in a household with somebody who has not been, or a, a group of people who have not been vaccinated. And that's, that's quite different itself from being in large, large groups without masks. Next slide. So it, it is appropriate to continue to wear a mask that covers your mouth and nose and stay six feet apart from people who don't live with you, avoid crowds and to wash your hands carefully. And I think those things we're doing because we continue to live in the time of a pandemic because people who are vaccinated still have some risk for disease. Usually it is much more mild disease. Um, and so, you know, those things remain advisable. They're probably advisable to reduce the risk of any kind of illness, particularly respiratory illness. And so I think they're, they're just good, good advice, at least washing hands and, and avoiding crowds at this point is just good advice. Um, and uh, I think we'll have to just see what happens with masks and, and how many people are vaccinated and, you know, but I think we should get used to wearing a mask for the current time and, and foreseeable future right now. Next slide. We'll pause there um, and take questions. I, I think um, we have some questions about, the, about feeding tubes that came in. I think people weren't as certain what to ask about the vaccines, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, Sarah and, and Dr. Barry. Um, great talks, a lot of fabulous information. Um, if anybody has any, um, any questions, you're welcome to put those in the chat box. Um, John, I'm not sure if you want to unspotlight and show everyone. Um, that way it's a little easier for us to field questions if someone wants to ask somebody uh, a question. Um, I can start off while people are sort of thinking about what they might want to say, um, because we did have some folks who um, emailed us some questions ahead of time. Um, they were all about feeding tubes. Um, so I can go ahead and share these. And if you all have other questions, um, a couple things you can do, you can type it in the chat box at the bottom. Um, there are also reactions, so you can, show a reaction. There's a raise your hand reaction. You can do that too. If you want to ask your question um, live, we can unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. Um, so while you're thinking about them, um, I'll read the ones that we had on feeding tubes early. Um, so the first question is, uh, can we put real foods through the tube if they're thin enough? 
So for example, a smoothie of non-dairy milk, protein powder, pureed fruits and vegetables, et cetera. And this person said, I know we must avoid like seeds and similar things like that. So is that something that you can do? It is absolutely. It's safe to put in like a real foods blend through the tube, but that's what um, the person asking the question was right on. The key is that it's thin enough to go through and there aren't any big chunks or particles of food. So it's absolutely okay to do that. You also want to make sure that you're flushing really well before and after with water, just because the real foods kind of puree that you make at home are a little bit higher of a risk for clogging up a tube. Um, Mary just added a question in the chat. Um, how often does a feeding tube need to be changed? Great question. So it depends a little bit on the tubes. So the, the ones at MGH, it, it also depends on the person. So the ones we place at MGH, the standard recommendation is to have those routinely exchanged every six months. And nothing unsafe or bad will happen if, if somebody goes on longer than six months. We saw a lot during the pandemic, people weren't coming in to have their G-tubes exchanged as much, which made a lot of sense at the time. Um, it's just that they can get with wear and tear. They can get kind of a little, um, like the cap can kind of wear down a little bit, or they can get a little bit discolored if you push it a little bit longer to like a year or so. But usually every six months is when we recommend a routine exchange. Um. Another Olga asked, my dad has an adapter for his peg tube. Does he need it? Um, I'd probably have to see the peg tube in order to know for sure. Um, but some tubes do come with adapters. There's one type that's called like a Lopez valve, or there's some that can kind of connect and disconnect. The Lopez valve has a little stop cock. Um, so there are ones that you can disconnect and Oh, that's the one. Great, Olga. Yeah, the Lopez valve is a common one. So you can disconnect that um, and close up the tube when you're not using the feeding tube. Um, the, those valves are kind of clunky and big. So if you leave it on, it's fine to leave it on. But if you do, sometimes they can just get in the way or dig into the skin. So it's, it's usually okay to take it off. Um, I've got another question here. Um, how do we know if our patient can digest certain real foods having been on a feeding tube for a long time? And I don't know if I, yeah. if that person's on the call here, if, if um, there's any clarification you want to add to that, but it might be a situation where we found a formula for a while and then are thinking about switching yeah. to switching more back. food preparation. So it's a good question. I mean, so one thing to say about feeding tubes is that it's not, it's not a, it's not the, the sort of perfectly typical way that we, that we eat. And there, there is actually a beginning to the digestion process that happens when you chew and swallow food and it mixes with saliva and some of the enzymes there. And so when we go directly into the stomach with foods, it's a, it is slightly different, doesn't feel like it maybe, but it is slightly different than going kind of through that process of, of chewing and swallowing and, and beginning the digestion there. And so um, it, it's, you know, so many of the formulas are a little more broken down than the food that we would eat to make them easier to digest from the stomach on and in the digestive tract. Um, which doesn't mean that, that, you know, more whole kinds of foods can't go into the feeding tube, but I think that, that sometimes they cause bloating or gas or loose stools or, you know, so it's something to, to be thoughtful about. Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah, I, no, I think that's, that's right on there. You may have some kind of slight differences in tolerance if you're switching from one versus the other, but um, your body should still be able to kind of, from a safety perspective, take in and absorb either one in, in general. Um, kind of along a similar vein, I think this is more of an opinion question. Uh, it might vary personally from one clinician to the next, but what do you think the best quality tube feeds are? Do you find that your patients tolerate something better than than others? Is there a, one that you have that's kind of a go-to? I mean, I have to, so I, we have to be a little cautious here I, because there's so much difference sort of person to person. And um, I think, you know, there's, there are some, some kind of, you know, basic formulas that we tend to start with that are pretty good for most people. And, and we kind of work to more complicated arrangements um, if, if there are symptomatic reasons to do that. From a calorie and, and sort of nutrient mix, any of them should work. It's really this tolerability kind of piece that, that, we, that we have to pay attention to. Sometimes there are specific things we have to, we have to be 
cautious about like diabetes, in which case there are, you know, there are some formulas that are better designed specifically for, for people like that. Um, another question here. Um, what's the best ways to increase caloric intake in a healthy way when a person is on a tube feed only? So they specifically mentioned the pump or a slow rate if you're trying to increase calories. Yeah, so it, it does depend person to person. There are some people that can maximize their calories just fine using the bolus syringe method. And uh, so some people might get in, you know, depending on the formula, about you know, anywhere from four to six cans a day is sort of like your 100% nutrition through the tube. So there are some people that plunge away all day and get in their six cans and do just fine. And then there's other people for whom the pump is, is um, because of tolerance issues is really the primary tool that's going to be able to get you to the six cans uh, in a 24 hour period. So there isn't one way that we think is like better over the other necessarily. It's just whatever method works well for you to, to up your calories as much as possible. Sarah, you also mentioned um, what happens if, if a tube feed, if a, a feeding tube actually becomes dislodged. Um, but how quickly do you need to see a doctor if um, a tube inadvertently comes out? You mentioned how quickly that can heal. What's what's the time frame we're looking at? Right away, I would say, rather than rather than wait. So when people call me and tell me, oh, my, you know, my feeding tube got pulled out, which isn't every day by any means, but once in a while that call comes through, we say, try to reinsert it back into the track to hold it in place and then just hop in the car and get straight to your local emergency room. So um, as, as soon as you can kind of get yourself up and ready and out of the house into the emergency room is, is the best way to do it, just to make sure that you're, um, that they can rescue it quickly. The longer you wait, sometimes the, the harder it is for them to reestablish a nice straightforward track to put the new tube in. Excellent. Um, another person asked, can we be trained to add water to the balloon? The process is simple and the Mickey button tends to pull away from the body, enabling bacteria to slip inside, which is not good. So can a caregiver be trained to add water to the balloon? I see. It's, it's possible. Honestly, what, how I advise people with the balloon um, is you don't necessarily have to, um, there are some kind of instructions that come and say you have to deflate the balloon to check and see how much saline is left in there and then push it back in. And we usually say, if there's not a problem with the two, you don't need to mess with the, um, with the saline syringe there. There are, um, if it's, if it's to deflate the balloon to exchange the tube, some people ask like, if I have a Mickey button, can I get it exchanged at home rather than having to go into the hospital? And typically we recommend that a clinician actually do that exchange. It does require some training. Um, at NGH, uh, we have a nurse practitioner who's currently going through a certification process to be able to exchange Mickey buttons, for example. So she's going through a training with interventional radiology. Um, so we would want, you know, sometimes a visiting nurse or a home-based nurse practitioner can come out to the house and do that um, or we'll just have people come into the clinic and it's a very quick appointment um, with regards to kind of the the site in there um, kind of manipulating the two I would I would recommend to prevent infection um, it's always good to wash your hands or have someone use gloves um, if they're going to be manipulating the feeding tube area um, and, and soap and water is kind of the best way to clean it um, but you know usually usually infection isn't something we see that um, that means you have to be particularly mindful of sort of like how you manipulate the tube or sort of worrying about triggering an infection if you're changing the balloon, as long as you're washing your hands and keeping the site clean. Um, it's, it's generally a clean procedure and it should be okay. I don't know if you have anything to add, James. Yeah, well, I would just, I would just sort of, um, first of all, I would say that you know, even with the Mickey button, there will be a little bit of, there can be a little bit of, of give. You don't want it to be too tight. If it's too tight, then it can actually start to be a problem for the skin underneath it um, and the blood flow to the skin underneath it. So if it's just a matter of sort of asking about overinflating the balloon, that's I, I think we we wouldn't we wouldn't want to just do that. Um, that little bit of sliding in and out doesn't tend to carry enough bacteria to to cause big problems. We do occasionally see um, bacterial or fungal infections of the skin around a feeding tube, and occasionally we'll use some topical antifungal or antibiotic. 
um, it's, you know, we, we certainly have, have prescribed oral antibiotics or, you know, antibiotics by, by the feeding tube for a more severe infection, but it's, it's quite uncommon that we run into that. Again, not that it doesn't happen, but it's not, you know, it's not something that we're dealing with very, very frequently. And I think that speaks to what Sarah was saying is that, you know, if you wash hands, um, it tends not to be a, a really, really good. Um, another question um, and kind of has to do with feeding tube manipulation. Um, and Sarah sort of speaks to um, your analogy about the, the pierced ears thing in, that you mentioned in your talk was, should you turn the tube daily? And if so, how much of a rotation? So we, at, I guess I can kind of only speak to the tubes we place at MGH. Um, so this may vary depending on the tube, but we don't usually have people religiously turn the tube daily. Um, and unless there's some sort of irritation or problem at the site, um, it's not, it's not something mandatory. Some people like to um, especially with like the Mickey buttons, like to give it a little rotate during the day, which is fine, fine to do once a day or every other day. Um, but the, you know, the balloon should hold it in place. It's sort of secured at the site. So there, there isn't really any kind of risk with, with never turning your tube. And then um, Elaine wrote a message in the chat. Elaine, please let me know if I'm misinterpreting this. Um, but is there anything to help our soft or liquid stool? That's a great question. There are many tricks and tips that we can look to to help with the, the soft and the liquid stool. Um, so I would check with your care team to kind of go through the formula that you're using and the method of administration so that we can try to offset that. There's some supplements you can add to help bulk up, bulk up the stool. Sometimes we'll try a different type of formula um, that has slightly different fiber content to help offset the loose stools. And then other times if we adjust the method of administration, I can help um, to kind of slow movement through the GI tract and help with some of the um, frequency that we might see along with the looser stools. So lots of things we can do. Excellent, thank you. Um, that looks like it's all the questions that I had that were pre-submitted. And I think I've got everybody's questions that were in the chat. Um, if anybody else has any questions about vaccines, including members of our team, please don't feel shy about unmuting yourself and asking a question or um, popping that in the chat box. Um, you know, there was certainly new news today about the J&J &J vaccine as well. Um, or if you want to share your experience with becoming vaccinated. Um, I know some people have used the, um, the vaccination at home program. Um, we've, we've promoted that as, as an option for people with ALS that are registered with us. So please feel free to unmute yourself and share or um, to put something in the chat box if you're more comfortable that way. At this point, it's perfectly okay for it to become more interactive, folks. So please feel free. Hey, this is Shannon. So I can tell you that I recently signed up for, so one of my friends had posted on Facebook that he had found a site um, that was doing the Johnson & Johnson. Um, I, am cho I was choosing to elect for the Johnson & Johnson because I have other... Um, other concerns around uh, adverse reactions, I'm allergic to the flu shot. So um, I just kind of wanted to do the one and done to not have to deal with the hassle. And, um, and so I had signed up um, and got an email today after the news came out um, that I may be getting the, there, the site that I have um, am using is applying for the Pfizer vaccine. So if you are, um, slotted to get a Johnson and Johnson, you may be contacted by the the place that you have made your um, vaccine arrangements with, um, and they may be either trying to schedule you in to get a Moderna or um, or Pfizer vaccine instead of the Johnson Johnson, so that you don't have to miss the date. I think that's what they're doing. At least it. At least that's what they're doing in, in my version. Um, the place that I was going to was up in Rutland. So you may be contacted. If you're not contacted in a day or so, you may want to reach out if you have something scheduled to the place that you are scheduled for um, to find out if 
they, um, I'm assuming they most likely are applying for either the Pfizer or Moderna as a backup. Um, but, and also, you know, consult with your physician uh, if you have any additional questions around the Johnson & Johnson. But if you already have something scheduled, and I, I believe if you're in the homebound program, um, they are using that Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So you may be receiving a call um, shortly about that as information comes out. Um, I know one of our coworkers was also spotted to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as well. So, um, so that's just ever evolving because of the information that just came out. I mean, one of the one of the really good things is that there is a lot more vaccine available than if this had happened, you know, two months ago, it would have been devastating. There is a lot more vaccine available. And so I think, um, you, you know, um, it may slow things down a bit, but it's not going to it is not going to make it impossible to get a vaccine at all. I think this is one of the most quiet groups I've ever seen. <laughs> I got tired and was floppy the afternoon after I got the vaccine first dose, but was fine after a nap. I had no problems with the second dose. Yeah, that's great feedback. I'm, you know, um, I think we've, I've heard many, many, many people have no, no, you know, no side effects to speak of, you know, with either dose or just a little bit with one of the doses. So uh, that's, you know, it's good, it's great. How many of the patients that you're seeing, Dr. Barry, would you say have been vaccinated? It's, a, it's interesting, I, so hard to do statistics based on what we remember, I, but I would say, you know, really a majority of, of people have been vaccinated, um, at least with one of, with one of the vaccines. Um, and, uh, it has been the the younger patients who've had a harder time until recently, um, and 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 now I think people are beginning to at least schedule their their vaccines. I, I think, you know, one of the key things that I that I want to get across is that there is a lot of biology behind this. There's a lot of safety testing behind it. There's a lot of efficacy testing behind it, and um, um, you know, I think people can feel confident about these vaccines being safe and effective. Uh, Cheryl just shared in the chat that her husband and her have, have um, both had two doses and had no symptoms at all. Yeah. The, oh, the other thing I should say is some people worry if they don't have symptoms that it's not working, but that's not true at all. It's working. It's just some people get the symptoms, some don't. Um, Stephen mentioned um, that he signed up for the homebound vaccine program, but he hasn't heard back yet. Stephen, do you want to share how long ago you signed up? And, and probably worth contacting again. And especially in light of, of today's news, I think it's, it's probably worth contacting again, um, you know, just to say, even, even if you were scheduled, uh, you know, as you said, uh, Jennifer, that, that, you know. Oh, he said it was when it was first reported available. So, I, you know, it sounds like wires got crossed. I would, I would reach out again. Um, maybe not today, maybe tomorrow, because there's some new news that will probably make their phone ring off the hook today and they're probably, you know, figuring out what the plan will be. Any other questions or comments? Um, I just want to say I got the um, Pfizer vaccine. I'm getting my next dose a week from Saturday. My husband got the Moderna and my son got the Johnson and Johnson. Oh. So we're sort of like the test family for everything going on. Uh, my son has a lot of allergies and he just had the aches and the pains and that thing for one day. I just had a sore spot when the shot went in and my husband, uh, his, his arm hurt a little bit more, but so between the three of us, uh, we're doing okay. I was amazed that when I got the shot, I was petrified. It was going to hurt like the flu shot and I didn't feel a thing. So yeah. whatever that means, I don't know, but we'll, we'll be the family for the shot vaccine. And we'll <laughs> reassuring. It's great. Yeah. I thought it was particularly cool that uh, I got my shot at um, Gillette Stadium. And I was telling Sarah when we were first um, kind of on the call getting coordinated here, um, that it was just, it, it felt historic, kind of mm -hmm. this massive public health undertaking during a global pandemic to be in 
um, a huge football stadium with hundreds of other people um, socially distanced, but it was a very, very efficient system. It took about an hour, which included, you know, a 15 to 30 minute observation period. Um, nothing much was happening during the observation period. People were just sitting and, and looking out across the fields and people were going out into this observation area and taking pictures. But um, it, I think it, that experience was something I probably will not forget. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's wonderful. I, really, I mean, what an amazing thing. I guess it's another, another good thing to just pause and say is that um, the science that got us to a vaccine this fast was built because of people investigating SARS from about, you know, mm -hmm. about 10 years ago and 15 years ago um, in, in Asia, there was this outbreak of SARS. SARS is a different coronavirus. And that um, was scary and then passed. And in the, in the years after that, there were scientists who continued to research SARS and coronavirus. It was very difficult for them to get funding. This was not in anybody's sort of in the center of anybody's vision. And yet the fact that they continued on with that research put us in a very, very good spot to start the research for vaccine. So, you know, um, sometimes you just don't know what the research that we're doing today will hold for tomorrow. I, I think that's a really important thing to say. I want to oh. just, so, oh, okay, yeah, no, go ahead. I was going to read that, but if you want to go ahead, Dr. Barry, go ahead. Stephen added something. Yeah, so Stephen added that um, he has a lot of food and, and seasonal allergies and, and is a little worried about side effects. You know, um, allergic side effects have been remarkably, remarkably rare with these vaccines. And um, they are, we are monitored um, afterward. And there, it's not that they do not occur, you know, they, they can occur. Um, they've been managed. It has not been a big problem. I think that's something that people were worried about in the beginning. And I think it might be because these are not proteins that we're giving, they're, they're, um, they're mRNA, which is a whole different thing. If there are um, an allergic reaction, you know, they're monitoring people for 15 to 30 minutes, sometimes an hour for people who are high risk. Right. Uh, would you expect a kind of allergic reaction that's severe like that to occur Quickly. outside of that immediacy of, of receiving the vaccine? You know, it, um, yeah, it should, we would think that it would happen quickly. We would think it would happen quickly. Now, you know, of course, one has to be conscious if you're developing, you know, symptoms that are unusual later, certainly pay attention to them and, and respond appropriately. But it, it would, it's, it's quite uncommon that, that 15 to one, 15 minute to one hour period is really based on, you know, what, what we've seen and would expect. Well, I think we're getting pretty close to, um, our 3.30 time window. Um, I know I've seen some folks in the chat window. Um, thank you both Dr. Barry and Sarah for um, your time today. We absolutely appreciate um, you coming over and joining us and sharing your wisdom um, and uh, your thoughts about things. Um, and we hope to have you again. Um, I know Dr. Barry really wants to talk to um, the community about research. So, um, We'd love to have you back. We're hopefully planning a symposium for later on this year. So Great. we'll probably tag you for that. All right. um, and yeah, if anybody else has any questions that you didn't happen to think of while we were on the call today, um, would it be okay if we were able to email you some questions and then share it with the community? Absolutely. So if you think of something that you're like, shoot, I didn't ask them, um, you can email one of us from Care Services and um, we'll compile a, a, a list of questions if you have them and send them off to Dr. Barry and Sarah as follow-up. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. <laughs>